Uh, good morning, my name is Michael Kay. I teach here at Washburn Law School, and I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Joseph Margulies uh, this morning. Uh, you've heard him before, and he'll be speaking uh, shortly again. Uh, before I do so, I would like to mention uh, the thanks of uh, Washburn University Law School and the university to the following um, persons and organizations for their support in providing uh, the Continental Breakfast this morning and their continuing support for our programs in our law school. They are Fleecing, Gooing, Coulson and Kitch, LLC, and Luann and Bill Leeds. Luann is a graduate, uh, 1906, uh, a 2006 graduate, I almost said 1906, a 2006 graduate of our law school and she was a student of mine. Uh, she's in practice in Kansas. Um, professor Margulies is a clinical associate professor of law, assistant director of the Roderick MacArthur Justice Center at Northwestern University School of Law. Uh, he authored the uh, book Guantanamo and the Abuse of Presidential Power, a book which won both the ABA Silver Gavel Award and the Scribes Award for 2007. He will be speaking on representing detainees. Thank you very much for appearing here today and welcome. Thank you very much and good morning. Um, I had a set of remarks prepared. I want to detour from those prepared remarks slightly uh, in order to segue from and maybe complement the observations that preceded mine by my friend Ambassador Prosper. Um, I think that you cannot listen to Ambassador Prosper without coming away with the firmly held belief that I have had for seven years in my work uh, challenging various aspects of the administration's detention policy, you cannot but believe that the actors who uh, created this policy acted in the utmost good faith. You simply, it seems to me impossible to maintain the, an attack on their motives. And I do not. Um, but I fear that there were pieces left out, necessarily so, because this wasn't the subject of his talk and he has a limited amount of time, uh, that left, leaves perhaps an incomplete picture when it comes to the topic that I want to address, which is uh, defending detainees in court. And so I want to start by addressing a question that was asked, which is why didn't they use Article 5 tribunals? Article 5 or uh, Article 190-8 tribunals as the military regulations are referred to them, uh, which are the sort of the implementing regs for Article 5, the process by which uh, the military has in place to separate wheat from chaff among the detainees they pick up uh, during uh, military operations. And the answer gets back to something that I said yesterday, which is that the policy drove the law. The law did not drive the policy. The law and the restraints placed on uh, conduct by the law did not determine the contours of the policy. The preferred policy was, forced, was made to shape the contours of the law. And they jettisoned, Ambassador Prosper is quite right, there were discussions about creating Article 190-8 tribunals at Guantanamo, Article 5 tribunals. In fact, a memo had been written about how they would make those tribunals, how they would apply 190-8 in the context of Guantanamo. They were not done in Bagram. Uh, there was an initial assessment at Bagram, which was the clearing place before they sent them to Guantanamo. Unfortunately, many of those assessments at Bagram were, we think this person, judging by traditional criteria, should be released. As best we can tell, this person is not associated. Uh, the, the problem with what we have here is you have a very high likelihood that the people you, you pick up look like disengaged civilians, act like disengaged civilians, and in fact are disengaged civilians. But because there was some risk, and so the assessment was made, because they're disengaged civilians, these people should be released. But because the assessment was made, maybe they just look and act like disengaged civilians, but in fact they're something more sinister. Perhaps they are people that we should not release using traditional, traditional criteria, and we will send them to Guantanamo instead. And as a consequence, a number of people, a substantial number of people were sent to Guantanamo who had already been cleared for release. 
And a memo was written when they first got there about how we will apply Article 190-8 to those people. And the decision was made to jettison that process. And the decision was made because of the prior policy determination. And that policy determination was this, that we need to create a particular kind of environment at Guantanamo. And Guantanamo's isolated status and, its, and the belief that it was beyond the reach of the judicial process is what allowed them to create this process, this, this, this environment. And that environment was one that they believed was necessary for an effective interrogation. Because first and foremost, I agree with my friend Dr. Turner who said yesterday, the coin of the realm post 9-11 was intelligence gathering. And Guantanamo was built to be the ideal interrogation facility. It was built to be the ideal interrogation center. And their conception, and I believe it was in good faith but mistaken, their conception was they needed to create a particular place where you could instill an environment, instill a sensation of hopelessness in the detainees. That you would, you would, through disruption in their sleep cycle, meal cycle, exercise cycle, cycles of light and day, you would create a sense of anxiety, of dread, of fear, of exhaustion, of debility, and that would break down whatever resistance they may have brought with them. It's not a particularly sophisticated methodology because the United States was not sophisticated in creating those kind of conditions. Why? Because they were unlike conditions that the United States had deliberately created, or at least DOD had deliberately created in the past.